He was testing it earlier. Okay, the operation manager. That worked. Seemed to be working. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things today. The first is the scattering of identity cards. And then I'm going to say some things about the Eichenwald approximation, which is something that Lloyd Lumber invented and, in fact, probably the best, almost certainly the best place to learn about the Eichenwald approximation is Glauber's original papers, because he's one of the handful of physicists who actually writes with the intention of somebody reading the paper and learning what the physicist had in mind. That's something extremely rare. And it's apparently getting worse. He's also a literate, which is also rare. All right, so we're talking about the scattering of identity cards. And let's remember that when we were using the formula E, B, I, K, Z, plus some F of F sub K for the energy, basically, or the magnitude of the momentum, E, B, I, K, R over R, K here being the momentum over H prime. What we had in mind here was that Z was actually equal to Z1 minus C2, and that R was the length of R1 minus R2. And so when we're talking about identical particles, we have to think about, we have to rewrite the wave function, and we have to imagine interchanging the particles. And if we interchange the particles, then theta goes to, whoops, pi minus theta, and P goes to P plus pi. So that's what happens when you have a particle here. This is probably going to be a terrible drawing. This is theta, and when you switch, this is the relative, this is the relative, the point representing the relative coordinates. When you interchange them to the two of them, P goes to, the particle goes down, the relative position goes down there, and the angle now is pi minus theta, so it's this angle here. Well, actually, I got that wrong. It's pi minus theta. This one is theta, and this is theta, and that's theta, and this is pi minus theta. And then, well, let's just look at it from two dimensions. Let's look at P. Here's P. We just add two pi to P, and we get P. It's the opposite direction. We add pi to P, thank you, and we get it's the opposite direction. With theta, it looks a little better like this. Again, in two dimensions. This is theta, and so instead of having that be theta, now this is the reversed theta, and this angle, this is also theta, and so this angle here is pi minus theta. That's a better way of doing it. All right, so what do we want then? Well, instead of looking at this simple picture, what we want to do is consider something that looks like this, e to the i k z plus e to the minus i k z plus e to the i k r over r times f k 
of theta and phi. Um, now, here I'm considering the case of symmetric. I should, I should have mentioned that. Let's, let's consider first the case of the scattering of two identical spinless particles. Since they're spinless, the space wave function has to be, the spin wave function has to be symmetric. And uh, since they're um, I'm actually, since they're spinless, they're bosons, and so the space wave function has to be symmetric. And so what we have is this, that k of pi minus theta pi plus pi. Okay, so that's, that's what replaces this part, perhaps, for some, for some normalization. And so the differential scattering cross-section g sigma d omega is proportional to uh, Fk of theta t plus Fk of pi minus theta t plus pi absolute value of square. Okay. So it looks like that. This is for, let me just repeat, 2 spin 0 identical term. Okay, so we then just expand that out. And there are two normal terms, fk of theta and c, absolute value squared, fk pi minus theta, phi plus pi, absolute value squared. And then there's the cross term, and you can write the cross term as fk theta p times fk star pi minus theta pi plus pi plus fk of theta phi star fk of pi minus theta pi plus pi. So those are the expressions. And that gives us the p sigma d omega is fk of theta and phi squared plus fk of pi minus theta pi plus pi squared plus twice the real part of fk of theta and phi fk star of pi minus theta Okay, so that's what we have as our um, as our differential scattering cross section. Now, suppose, as is usually the case, that the uh, scattering amplitude has no dependence upon the variable upon the angle of phi. Um, in that case, what you have is something simpler. You have e sigma d omega is fk of theta squared, in fact, plus fk of pi minus theta squared plus twice the real part of fk of theta fk star pi minus theta. Now, at the angle theta equal to pi over 2, this is d sigma d omega equals twice fk pi over 2 squared plus this, this is pi over 2, so is this. So this is just the absolute value squared. The real part is the whole thing. So it's pi plus 2 fk of pi over 2 squared, which is all together. 4 fk of pi over 2 squared. So there's a, cons there's a there's constructive interference because the particles are identical at Pi over two. Now, of course, it could be that the scattering amplitude of pi over two is zero, 
in which case you don't see any enhancement at all. But what you expect is that, so here we have, in fact, the best way to describe this is sort of a colliding beam description, and that's why this sort of makes sense for colliding beams. And, in fact, in really high-energy accelerators, like the LHC and the large electron positron collider and the Fermilab collider, they all are colliding beam machines with equal energy. There was one in Germany called HERA or something. It has unequal energy. Well, it's electron protons. Anyway, to start with the tangent. So what you expect then is some enhancement at pi over 2 if you have a space wave function that's symmetric for some reason. And the space wave function, the easiest way for it to be symmetric is for you to have a case where the particles are spin zero. And so the bosons and the space part has to be symmetric. The spin part has to be symmetric because there is one. So the space part is symmetric. Okay, let's now consider the centering of spin one-half particles. And why don't we erase the board for a second. Any questions about this? It's certainly true that the treatment would be a lot simpler if we hadn't adopted relative coordinates in the very beginning. So that's something that makes the whole treatment a little bit confusing. In fact, ideally, an ideal pedagogical treatment would first do the scattering of identical particles and then start using relative coordinates. Anyway. All right, now suppose we instead have two spin one-half particles. And now suppose the initial state is spin polarized. Now, spin polarized beams are hard to do. But sometimes you can get the thing somewhat done. So in other words, suppose the initial state is spin up, spin up. Then the space state must be symmetric. Anti-symmetric. And anti-symmetric because, of course, the whole wave function must be anti-symmetric. So now what do we have? Now what we have is d sigma d omega. And I'm going to talk in my notes a little bit. Let me suppress the p dependence. Well, I'll keep it for a little while and then suppress it. So what we have is fk of theta and t minus fk is pi minus theta, pi plus pi, absolute length squared. And so this, of course, gives you fk of theta and t squared plus theta plus fk of pi minus theta, pi plus pi squared. And now we get a minus sign, minus twice the real part of fk of theta and t, fk star of pi minus theta, t plus pi. Okay, so it's like this, but there's a minus sign. You always find the Fermi ones with all these minus signs. Now, if we again go to the case where there's no p dependence, so as usual, it's usually true that there isn't any p dependence. 
It depends on the SMU going to be. In that case, what we have is D sigma D omega is, let me suppress the K. So this is F of theta squared plus F of pi minus theta squared minus twice the real part of F of theta F star of pi minus theta. Now, if we go to the angle pi over 2, what do we see? We see D sigma D omega at pi over 2. That's twice F of theta F of pi over 2. Because, of course, pi minus pi over 2 is pi over 2. So that's that. And then we have minus twice the real part of F of pi over 2. Absolute value squared. We get zero. Cross-section actually vanishes. And so we should see, in fact, if we have spin up, spin up, then at pi over 2, D sigma D omega is actually zero. Okay. Any questions? So let me... Let me go now to a more realistic case. A more realistic case of spin one-half scattering. We don't have... We don't have polarized beams. But in this case, what you have is... You see there are... The spin states are random. And so... So spin one-half again. Two spin one-half particles. Identical particles. But now, unpolarized beams. Unpolarized beams. And so there are three triplet states. Three states that are spin symmetric. And only one state that is anti-symmetric. So three states here. One state there. So what you expect then is that three quarters of the time, you've got a... So three quarters of the time, we have the space state is anti-symmetric. And one quarter of the time, space state is symmetric. So now what do we have? We have three sigma and omega is a quarter at... Let me... I'm going to suppress the K again. I'm going to suppress K and I'm going to suppress phi. No phi dependence. Plus three quarters at the theta minus at the time minus theta. And what do we get? Well, we're going to get at the theta minus at the time minus theta. Okay. And what do we get? Well, we're going to get at the theta minus at the time minus theta. Okay. And what do we get? Well, we're going to get at the theta minus at the time minus theta. Okay. And what do we get
theta at two base squared plus f of pi minus theta at two base squared. Now we're going to get um, twice the real part here minus twice the real part there. So that's going to be um, uh, one half minus three halves. And so that's just simply minus the real part of f of theta f star of pi minus theta. So that's our differential scattering cross section. Now again, if we go to the angle pi over two, we get e sigma d omega is equal to two f of pi over two squared minus f of pi over two squared, which is just simply f of pi over two squared. So we get uh, we get a reduction. We get some destructive interference, but not as much as in the plane, or as in the spin polarized case, in which case the wave function had to be anti, space wave function had to be anti symmetric All right, any questions? What's of course really striking is, is uh, this particular case here where you have the particles uh, spin up and um, uh, you should get zero scattering at 90 degrees. Okay, now um, the eichel approximation. Um, This approximation is based on something called the semi-classical approximation. By the way, um, in addition to those crackers, I do have chocolate. Um, Questions or corrections uh, are worth um, Okay. So first of all, where do you apply this? Well, the first thing is that you have to be able to use this um, approximation where the wave function S of X goes as E to the I S of X over H bar. This is kind of the leading term in the path of the the actual path integral is well, an integral over all sorts of trajectories, and it's e to the i s, where x is the final point and um, an x initial, and, and then we integrate over some initial and some side initial of x and then one over h bar. So that's the exact uh, integral formulation. We're going to approximate it uh, by, by using um, just, just one term in the action. When is this approximation valid? Well, it's basically valid at high energies when one over p which is lambda bar is much less than the potential divided by the gradient of the potential. And we want E, the energy, to be much greater than the magnitude. So this, this is something that works at high energy and um, weak potential. 
So what is this, what is the equation for S? The equation for S is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, grad S squared over 2M plus V is equal to E, which is H bar squared K squared over 2M. And so that means that grad S squared is equal to H bar squared K squared minus 2M V. And so we can say that DS of X with respect to Z, we're taking the square root of this, is the square root of H bar squared K squared minus 2M V of X. Here the idea is that X is some impact parameter V plus Z times Z hat. And the potentials of short range, so V has to be small. Z of course can be big because Z goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the idea is that particle goes past the scattering center and the distance of closest approach is magnitude V. Well then we can integrate this action when we get S of X over H bar is an integral from minus infinity to Z. DZ prime K squared minus 2M over H bar squared. So we squared this thing in other words. Over H bar squared V of V squared plus Z prime squared. And then plus some constant. Now I'm puzzled as to, oh we pulled out the, we divided by H bar, that's why we, so that's all right. Oh and this is, hold on, this is the one half power. Okay, now we're going to assume that V is small. And so we're going to expand that. And we're going to expand the square root. Effectively what we do is we've got this K is huge and V is small. And so what we do is we write this as minus infinity to Z. DZ prime, we pull out a K and then we have the square root of 1 minus 2M over H bar squared K squared V of square root of V squared plus Z prime squared. And then plus C. Now we expand the square root and we'll get a very high K. And when we do that, we get, I'm going to use some of this board here, S of X over H bar then is approximately, well K just gives us KZ minus, when we expand we get a 1 half, so we get a minus M, and then we have to multiply by K over H bar squared K, integral from minus infinity to Z, DZ prime V of square root of V squared plus Z prime squared. And remember, we have, this thing is the usual term, usual free term. In other words, when we substitute for S of X over H bar, we put that 
up here in this exponential, the leading term is EBIKZ. So that's the usual term. And the 1 over K here is, um, shows that, that, that this should work at high energy. Okay. So that's our um, that's our situation here. Okay. So in other words, our wave function psi of x is approximately e to the i k z e to the minus i m over h bar squared k integral minus infinity minus infinity to z um, v of square root of b squared plus t prime squared t z prime. And if we imagine we imagine that the high energies, this is small, and so this is going to give us um, uh, e to the i k z um, The leading term is in the ITZ. Okay. So, you know, what do I want to compare this to? Well, let's look at what the scattering cross section is. Scattering, and let me, instead of writing F sub K as theta T, I'm going to write it as F of K and K prime. K prime being the final direction. And the answer is minus 1 over 4 pi. Um, integral PQ x prime e to the minus i k prime dot x prime uh, e to the i k dot r and e to the minus i m over h bar squared k integral from minus infinity to z v of square root of Okay, so this this uh, K, KZ I've rewritten as the initial vector K uh, dot R, and that should have been um, well. I'm thinking of this as a X now. Anyway, it's that variable, and that variable, is, or it's rather, it's, it's this variable, B plus Z, Z minus. All right, the, 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 what we now need to do is we need to approximate this uh, expression, and so we're going to say, um, we're going to write D cubed x, I don't know why I have a prime on all these x's, d cubed, oh, I'm some of the money. d cubed x I'm writing as b db db tz. So b, in other words, we've got here x like this, Y comes out of the board, and Z is in this direction. Z is the direction of the incident beam. And V is some vector with points that's perpendicular to the Z axis. And phi is this angle here. This is B. Okay, and now we've got here K minus K prime. Dot x. So this is k minus k prime dot b plus z z prime. Now that's going to equal k minus k prime dot um, z hat times z. 
and minus B times K prime. Because K is in the direction Z, so K is perpendicular to B. All right, so this is equal to um, K times 1 minus cosine theta, where this is, this is K, this is K prime, this is the scattering angle theta, um, Z minus K prime dot B. Okay, but theta, we're looking here in the forward direction. And in the forward direction, theta is very small. This is equal to K uh, Z theta squared over 2 minus K prime dot B. I'm going to approximate this as minus K prime dot B. Now, uh, you might say, gee, Z is going to get large. Well, what we're thinking of, though, is that um, this angle here, this, this value of Z, um, well, I don't know what to say about that, but we're going to, in any case, assume that theta is smaller, so we can like this, this Z theta squared. Okay, so what's k prime dot t? Well, k prime dot t is k sine theta. Oh, we're, 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 we're going to look at scattering in the xz plane. So xz plane scattering. Plane is scattering. That means that k prime lies in the x in the x hat and uh, b was in b cosine b b x hat plus b sine b b y. Okay. Okay, now this term z is a final of all of this, so it doesn't count at all. And we only have this term, and x hat's final of the y's, and we just get that from that. And so this gives us kb sine theta cosine tb. And we're at small angles, small scattering angles, so this is kb theta cosine of dB. Okay, so now our scattering amplitude Remembering the, let's see, gee, I think I left out something here. Hold on. No, I left out something. I left out something important. This, um, in, in the description that we were following, there would be a big U here, but if we trace that by V of, the square root of d squared plus z squared, uh, and then we put in a 2m over h bar squared. Gosh, I don't know. It was right here in my notes, but somewhere I forgot to write it down. And that, of course, explains why this z isn't going to get very big, because um, once z is big, the amplitude falls off rapidly, um, because v v goes to zero rapidly uh, with distance. Okay, so our formula then here is uh, minus one over four pi, two m over h bar squared, integral zero to infinity dtb. That's from this uh, thing over here. 
integral 0 to 2 pi dTv. Then uh, these two phase factors give us this term here, which then becomes that. And so we have e to the minus i k b theta cosine b b. And then the rest of it is an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dz of v of square root of b squared plus z squared e to the minus i m over a plus squared k integral from minus infinity to z b of square root of b squared plus z prime squared e z prime. Okay, so that's a <coughs> somewhat complicated expression, but there are some miraculous uh, relations that we can apply. First of all, there's this integral relation. 0 to pi d p b e to the minus i k b theta cosine p b is equal to 2 pi j 0 so function of L cylindrical vessel a, B, theta. Of course, computer programs can handle these things. So even though you don't want to do it with your fingers, Fortran, Intel, and so forth, to the rest of it. Okay. Moreover, this thing, although it looks absolutely impossible, is actually easy to evaluate because this thing here times that is really the derivative of this with respect to z. So in other words, integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dz is v of square root of e squared plus z squared e to the minus i m over h bar squared k integral minus infinity to z v of square root of e squared plus z prime squared e z prime is equal to an integral from minus infinity to infinity dz of i h bar squared k over m e by dz of e to the minus i m over a plus squared k integral minus infinity to z v of square root of e squared plus c prime squared e z prime. Well, I'm, my arm is over square So, an integral of the derivative, well, we can do that. That's i h bar squared k over m. And that means we just evaluate this thing e to the minus i m over h bar squared k integral minus infinity to z v of square root p squared plus c prime squared p z prime at minus infinity and plus infinity. What minus infinity and z is minus infinity, this is just 0, e to the 0 is 1, so we have minus 1. When this is equal to plus infinity, we just have to e to that integral. And so this is all together equal to i h bar squared k over m e to the minus i m over h bar squared k integral minus infinity to plus infinity v of square root of b squared plus c prime squared d c prime minus 1. So this thing really looked awful. It's not nearly as bad. And of course, um, we pretend that we know what the potential is. 
in any event, that's the expression that we know that comes on up. So, what do we have then? We need to take this answer and put it back in here. We have this identity of the 2 pi and the zero cylindrical vessel function. Put it in there. And what we get is F of K and K prime to be minus 1 of 4 pi 2M over H bar squared equals zero to infinity E D B 2 pi to the zero of K B theta I H bar squared K over M. Now what we're going to do is we're going to define delta of B as minus M over 2 K H bar squared. In other words, it's going to be one half of this phase, essentially. One half of this angle. Integral minus infinity plus infinity V of square root of B squared plus Z squared DZ. So this is delta of B. What we have here is E to the 2 pi delta of B minus 1. B, remember, is the impact parameter. And altogether, then, that is equal to minus I K integral zero to infinity D D B J zero of K B theta E to the 2 pi delta of B minus 1. Okay, so that's the Eichmel approximation. This gives, then, the scattering angle, scattering amplitude for wave number K, angle theta. We're integrating over impact parameters. We expect only small impact parameters to be important. And that's governed by this thing, because when delta is small, this is just 1 minus 1. Delta depends upon V of the square root of B squared plus C squared. Okay, so that's the approximation. As I said, if you want to study this more, I'd recommend Robert's original papers. In fact, he invented this back in the 50s at some point. And then every... He came back to it several times as the physics changed, the accelerators improved, and there was a new energy range. He'd bring this formalism out and write some more papers. I don't know if he's going to be doing it for the LHC, but I think he was doing it for the Tibetan. All right, any questions about this? All right, I guess 
for a couple more topics on scattering. Um, you see, the trouble with scattering theory, as I said to you before, is that when you change the, um, basically change the energy or the underlying theory, the formalism of scattering theory, the equations, the look of everything changes a lot. And um, so there are many, many different scattering theories. And um, we'd be here forever if we were, if we wanted to examine all of them. So I think we, we need to leave this subject soon. And what I may do is assign some more of it as homework problems. Um, we have a few minutes left, though, and I think what I'll do is I'll give you another look at um, scattering theory. This is a formalism that was developed by, in fact, Robert's uh, thesis advisor, Julian Schwinger, and uh, I assume it was his student, Lippmann. Anyway, it's called the Lippmann-Schwinger formalism. And... Um, all right, so let me just describe it to you. So this, this is a more sophisticated uh, approach to scattering than the one that I used for, from the beginning uh, that was based on basically on Cohen-Tanucci's approach. So again, we're going to say H is H0 plus V, and we're using relative coordinates again. Um, and so H0 is uh, P relative squared over twice. I'm going to just use M. M, of course, is actually the reduced mass. And um, I'm going to say H0 phi is going to be some E phi. So these are the just the plane wave states. These are complete. Um, they don't need to be plane wave states. They can be plane wave states or they can be uh, KLM states. As to say, the partial wave. And the thing that we want is to solve is H0 plus V times some psi is equal to E psi. Same E. Same E. So here is the Whitman Schwinger uh, equation. It's phi is equal to the plane wave or the, the P state, I should say, the eigenstate of H0 plus 1 over E minus H0 plus or minus I epsilon. And this, of course, is essentially a Green's, a Green's operator. Schwinger love love Green's functions. The potential and then psi itself. Okay, why does this work? Well, clearly as E go, as sorry, V, as V goes to zero, becomes the zero operator, the second term goes away. Psi goes. Psi goes to five. So that's that's what we expect. So that's one good thing about it. Next, if we operate on it with e minus h zero, then what do we get? We get e minus h0 on this eigenstate of e, h0 with eigenvalue e, so we're going to get 0 for that. And then we get e minus h0 times 1 over e minus h0 plus or minus i epsilon v psi. Uh, once we have these two expressions, this cancels any zeros here. We don't need the i epsilon. We just get one. And so this is just equal to v sine, this being zero. So altogether, then, 
this tells us that B sine is equal to H0 plus B sine. So in other words, psi is an eigenstate of the full Hamiltonian with the same energy, E. All right, now to continue further here, I'm going to need to erase some of the squares. The blackboard is blackest over there, but that's where I just drew it. So I guess I can come over here. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to run out the clock for a flip and turn. As far as we get, well, that'll be it. I don't think I want to continue the flip and turn. We can go a little bit further. Okay, let's take the inner product with the position operator of the flip and turn. So the position operator bar. Oh, I should have said that because of the plus or minus here, we're going to distinguish them with a plus or minus on the side. Well, put the plus or minus there. All right, okay, so that's the integral equation for the solution. In particular, if B is equal to T, then X B across is X T, which is E to the I P X, P dot X, or H bar divided by T pi H bar to the three halves. And we can substitute in there. We can also, though, take the inner product of the Lipp and Schwinger equation with simply a P I E state, a P bar, instead of an X bar. And if we do that, what we get is P psi plus or minus is P phi plus, now, this P is an eigenstate of this with eigenvalue P squared over 2M there. And so we get simply 1 over that operator, which is very mysterious. Otherwise, it becomes simply a number, E minus P squared over 2M plus or minus I epsilon. But now we have the inner product of P with the potential, which is normally a function of X, psi plus or minus. So that's the integral equation there. And this thing, if phi itself will be one of the P states typically, and in that case, this would be a delta function of P minus P phi. Now,
thing here. Well, as I said, Schwinger loved Green's functions, and so this is a Green's function. What is it, and how do we evaluate it? Well, you can call it T plus or minus for X and X prime. This is then, I'm going to call it H bar squared over 2M, X going over T minus H0 plus or minus I epsilon X prime. And what is this? Well, it turns out it's nothing more than minus 104 prime X minus X prime E to the I E to the plus or minus I K X minus X prime. Okay. Now, why is that the case? This is where there's some music coming from. I think they're playing a movie on the front. I see. Okay. All right. So how do we see what this is? Well, one way of coping with this is to insert a complete set of P states twice. So this becomes H bar squared over 2M integral D cubed P D cubed P prime X P P 1 over P minus H0 plus or minus I epsilon P prime P prime X prime. Now, just using the fact that this is E to the I P dot X over H bar or from the normalization factor, if you try the normalization factor, H bar squared over 2M 1 over 2 pi H bar cubed. It turns out that because this operator here is an eigen, these states on the left and right, left and right, are eigen states of this, of H0 and therefore of this Green's operator. And so this just gives us a delta cubed of P minus P prime. And so we wind up with simply one integral. D cubed P, we have an E to the I P X minus X prime over H bar from the four and a half functions. And this thing here becomes a denominator P minus P squared over 2M plus or minus I epsilon. Okay, let's see how much time we have. Well, what you do is you let the Z axis, you choose the P Z axis to be the X minus X prime direction. You choose that to be the P Z axis. And then this turns out to be 1 over 2M 2 pi squared H bar integral 0 to infinity integral minus 1 to 1 D cosine theta E to the I P X minus X prime cosine theta over H bar P squared D P over this denominator E minus P squared over 2M plus or minus I epsilon. And the D cosine integral is easy to do. And then I'm going to skip a couple of steps. They're in the online notes. 
I'm going to write P as H bar Q. So now we're able to reduce this eventually to a contour integral. So I've got to hurry up. Um, okay, we're there. This then turns into the following. P plus or minus of X prime is minus 1 over P prime X minus X prime. So in other words, after you do the first integral, the D cosine integral, you get two um, The D cosine integral brings down a P X minus X prime. That's where this one comes from. And so what we have is that 1 over 2 pi I integral 0 to infinity DQ and we have E to the I Q X minus X prime minus Q to the minus I Q X minus X prime And this is then Q squared minus K squared minus the plus sign of sign. So we have beta sign change there. Um, this can then be rewritten as minus 1 over 2 pi. Let me call X minus X prime just R. So I'm going to write R as X minus X prime. So this is 1 over 2 pi i, and we can change this integral to an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, eq q e to the i q r over q minus k minus the plus i epsilon times q plus k plus or minus I epsilon. So you can verify that the denominator, if you multiply it out, is in fact uh, Q squared minus K squared minus the plus I epsilon times 2K. Well, 2K is positive, and the only thing that's important here is the sign and the fact that we have an infinitesimal. So this is really an epsilon R number. So now we have a contour integral that we can do, and we pick up poles. Um, if we have the top case, minus plus, or the minus plus case, what you do is you complete the contour by adding a ghost contour like that. You have a pole here, and you miss that pole. And the answer is the answer for this part the 1 over 2 pi i part is simply e to the i k r over 2. If you do the minus plus case, then what you've got is um, a pole here and a pole there. And um, once again, you put a ghost contour on the top, and then you get e to the i minus i k r over 2. And so the final answer then is G plus or minus epsilon x prime is equal to minus one over four pi twenty four r e to the plus or minus r, where r is that is the distance between x and x prime. Um, so that's um, 
that's how the cookie crumbles. You get either plus IKR over 2 or even minus IKR over 2. This minus sign of the pole is a minus sign of the cookie. Okay, so that Green's function, of course, is the Green's function for the operator for plus E plus K squared. G plus or minus X and X prime is delta Q and X minus X prime. Okay, I think we can quit here. I don't know if we need to go on with this because, as I say, it's a nice formula. But there's just so many scattering formulas. All right. So one of you suggested that we do something about the atomic weight functions that occur in molecules, say, in chemistry. If others of you have other ideas. Oh, yes, one of you asked something that surprised me because it's something that's covered normally in a quantum optics course. So I don't really know why we should do it in a quantum mechanics course. I guess we could. That was the formulas on the driver. I don't know. It happened 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. And I think what we surely would need to do is quantize the electromagnetic field, do atomic and perturbation theory, and then do some scattering problems with the interaction of light with matter. Maybe, in fact, we should do that first and then see what time is left for other things. We certainly need to do that. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you.